One Week Season. And welcome in, OWS fam. So glad you are with us. We are back in the DFS lab. As always, presented by One Week Season, where the purpose of this show, build a DraftKings lineup and use that to talk through the upcoming slate as we are on this Tuesday, October 1st. So we got week five coming up. Obviously, a very early look at this one. I'm your host, Cheese Man, and uh, so glad to be with you here. And now welcoming up Hilo. Uh, Hilo, how's it going, man? How was uh, you know, week four for you? Any just high-level analysis um, as we look back for a second on week four? It's going good, man. Um, week four was my first in-earnest sweat, um, so that was kind of nice. Did not nice. bring it home. Um, Who'd you I have? Was in, I was in 19th heading into the afternoon slate in the 555 milli. Um, and I had made the decision to pivot to a low owned George Kittle. Um, like it. So yeah, I knew I figured, I figured fading the Cardinals in, in, uh, Washington game, um, and going over to the low ownership on Kittle was probably my best chance to ship. Um, didn't work out. The, the the game environment just didn't pan out for for the Niners. Uh, I mean, Kittle caught that crazy touchdown over triple coverage, um, but he like <laughs> he had one target in the second half. So um, yeah, it didn't work out. But uh, and then also in that same game environment, San Francisco's defense uh, smoked me, scored like twenty two fantasy points. So uh, it wasn't didn't wasn't meant to be this past week. But um, super stoked with the process, um, and I feel like it's coming, man. That's awesome. I mean, that's, I mean, just, you know, taking shots on goal is just being in that position is, you know, that's the position to be where at some point things are going to break your way, but that's awesome. man. 19th going into the afternoon. And I mean, I do like that piddle or that pivot on, uh, on to Kittle. I mean, I loved, a li- I had a little Debo, a little Kittle. And like you said, didn't work out. Um, uh, but that is awesome to hear, man. Um, it just any any other thoughts on week four? Just things that you saw that that were interesting to you before we kind of jump in here. Yeah, scoring's up a little bit compared to the first three weeks. Um, offenses are starting to figure things out, um, which they did not <laughs> look good opening the season. Obviously, scoring was, you know, passing touchdowns were at a ten year low, field goals were at a thirty year high through the first two weeks. So this is. Um, we're starting to get into, I think, the adjustment phase of the season. Um, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth type of stuff. So we kind of yeah. see that in in the context of an individual game, right? Everyone comes in with their game plan over the first quarter, quarter and a half. They're, they're running their game plan, how they plan for the week, how they're approaching specific opponent. And then after that, it's the adjustment phase. So um, we're kind of in the adjustment phase of the season right now. And then before we move to when once we start getting to weeks 13, 14 and beyond, that's kind of the oh shit phase of the season where all bets are off and we're trying to we're trying to string together a, a postseason run, right? So um yeah, right now in the adjustment phase, it looks like teams are starting to figure a little bit of stuff out on offense. Um we had on Monday night football, the second game on Monday night football last night, we had the highest scoring game of the season um, between the Seahawks and the lions. Um, so we're starting to see some game environments pop. Um, we're going to focus on some of those when we build a roster here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely excited to get into it. Um, I mean, you look at week five coming up and as you said, it seems like Vegas is also starting to kind of, get in line with that thought that that points are up because you have now two games that are 50 plus in terms of the over unders. And then another three that are basically 47 or more that Baltimore Cincinnati games, 51 Arizona, San Francisco at 50.5. And of course that, that one of the top has Derek Henry, who he just has, uh, you know, obviously put up two massive games and everyone saw what he did on Sunday night. So what do you like going into week five? What's kind of your, your first, a look. Let me just pull up actually DraftKings here, yeah. and um, we had talked about we're going to do the spy today. The du- actually no, the double spy. So yeah, it's two hundred entries and eight hundred and thirty three in terms of the field size. Uh, what what stands out to you about the field size there, and just how to attack this contest? Yeah, so we started off kind of this series by attacking a millimaker maker, and then we we did that for a couple of weeks, and then we came down to the spy, which is four thousand four hundred forty four entries. Now we're going to look at some strategy stuff for a smaller field single entry contest like the double spy. So 
I think just altering like how we approach different contests is going to be beneficial to the viewers. So we're going to, we're going to attack the double spy today. I love it. Yeah. So, but yeah, back to my question, what do you like going into week five? What stands out to you, uh, you know, on this slate? Yeah, this this Baltimore Cincinnati game kind of jumps off the page immediately. We have a Bengals team that is leading the league in pass rate over expectation through the first month of play. We have a Baltimore Ravens team who is the most pass funnel defense in the league. They're allowing 57.5 rush yards per game and about just under 260. I think it's like 257 uh, pass yards per game. So when those two things meet, it tells me one the Ravens should have additional offensive plays to run from scrimmage playing an opponent that leads the league in pass rate over expectation. And two, the Bengals are probably going to be forced to attack in their preferred means. So through the air um, with early down passing, trying to move the ball here. So that jumps out immediately to me. Also, we have some injury stuff that we need to monitor, particularly with the Colts. Um, Jonathan Taylor picked up a high ankle sprain. So we're likely to see Trey Sermon as the starting running back in week five. And then with Anthony Richardson, who picked up like hip and something else stinger, um, he just standard, like he's not going to go down. He's going to accept contact when he's rushing and that happened and he got hurt. Um, so do we see Joe Flacco? We are likely to not see Jonathan Taylor. Um, and against a, a Jacksonville team that is another pass funnel defense and the Jaguars are starting to figure a little bit out. They could get Evan Ingram back. Yes. So that game environment is probably my favorite of the ones that is in that sub elite tier. So you mentioned the two games up top, that game environment stands out to me early week. Um, again, we're recording this on Tuesday. So, um, yeah, I kind of want to attack that one here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Joe Flacco, I mean, do you think that with the way Indianapolis likes to run their offense and if Flacco is under center, could we see him air it out more than maybe just trying to run the ball? Yeah, I think so. And I think we we got a little sneak peek of what to expect last season when it was Gardner Minshew under center. So um, we're going to build this as if Joe Flacco is the starter. Love it. Um, but... I mean, Anthony Richardson is now only, what, 500 more than Joe Flacco? So um, he, it, it won't be very hard to pivot up if it's Anthony Richardson in. So we're going to start this roster attacking that game environment. We're going to do it via Joe Flacco, Josh Downs, and Michael Pittman. Um, Josh Downs is a guy that I would consider... Uh, more than Michael Pittman if it's Anthony Richardson. But if it's Joe Flacco, I mean, both of these guys are going to get peppered. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, Josh Downs, I mean, he I think put up pretty good. Yeah, got nine targets and put up quite a good game against Pittsburgh. And, I mean, really, this stack about 15, 16K. And if this is a game where Joe Flacco does drop back, 30 plus times definitely have some ceiling there. Do you want to bring back from Jacksonville here? Well, before we do that, we I'll, I'll quickly mention this three player stack of Joe Flacco, um, Josh Downs and Michael Pittman is 16.6 K. And if you remember from last week, our primary of Andy Dalton, Chuba Hubbard and Deontay Johnson was exactly 16.6 K. So we're kind of starting it off on the same point or as far as roster construction goes, and if we're on a, if we want to hit a, a 4K multiplier, which keeps us on pace for a, a 200 point score, yeah. this three man stack needs to average 22.1 fantasy points per player. So, well within the range of outcomes for this three person stack this week, if it's Flacco under center. Absolutely. And if it's Richardson, you probably would just do, you'd say you would not prefer Pittman, but you would prefer Downs with Richardson, or was it the other way? Yeah, I prefer Downs with Richardson just based off of how he's being utilized and the kind of relative shortcomings of Richardson through the air. That said, we did see Pittman pick up two chunk yardage gains. I think one was um, they were both right around 30 yards with Richardson before he departed. So um, that could be schematic. I haven't watched the tape on that game yet, so I don't know. I can't speak intelligently on it. Um, but the fact that Pittman picked up two chunk yardage gains 
with uh, Richardson under center, there could be something there. I just don't know yet because I haven't watched the tape on that game. Absolutely, yeah, because Pittman typically is seen as kind of the, not the chunk yardage guy, more of a takes a ton of volume to get there and, and and hasn't put up a ton of a ton of games in his career where you'd be stoked at his price. Even though his price is, is at 6K, that feels reasonable. Yeah, and this is, this is mo- mostly a game environment bet, um, and that game environment looks a lot nicer if it's Flacco under center because we expect them um, to be kind of airing it out already, expecting to be without Jonathan Taylor. Um, against a, a pass funnel defense. So, um, I mean, back to your question. Yeah, I, I do want to bring it back because we're kind of attacking this game environment. Um, and I think it's just most natural to do so with Brian Thomas Jr. Um, Absolutely. I'd expect Evan Ingram to have a solid chance of returning this week, which kind of eats into Christian Kirk's expected role. Typically, those guys are working similar areas of the field. Um, historically in Jacksonville, we've seen the either of those guys, if the other is out kind of kind of hand, have that um, role to himself, but when they're both in, it's much um, it's a much shakier fantasy bet. I think betting on Christian Kirk. So expecting Evan Ingram to come back. I like Brian Thomas jr. Against the high cover three rates of Indy here um, with a run game that is struggling. Yeah, this it's, it's gotta be BTJ for me here. Absolutely. And so we got this initial stack, Flacco, a Flacco led stack. So it's it's not a super cheap stack, but it definitely is like more of a lower end in terms of price stack. Is that because at some point we're going to be talking about some high price studs here? And I was looking at this slate a little yeah. bit. You mentioned Trey Sermon. Maybe he will get streamed and end up being highly owned, but I just didn't feel like there was I did notice Josh Downs, but outside of a couple other players didn't seem like there's a whole ton of value, but there's definitely some higher price players that, you know, you're going to want to get up to or try to get up to this week. And so this seems like a good way to open up some salary in order to hopefully get to some of those, those higher price players. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, pricing, one of the big themes of this season so far is pricing has been tight. Um, yeah. DraftKings has been fairly aggressive, particularly at running back. Um, in pricing guys up to match kind of their expected role. Um, They were a little slow on Jordan Mason. So we saw that when we were kind of attacking that for a few weeks, but now he's priced up in the sevens. Um, That kind of that discussion is, is really pertinent here. Cause like you said, I expect Trey Sermon to gain some steam, um, particularly if Jonathan Taylor misses Wednesday, Thursday practice. Um, And on the slate where we're kind of starved for value, he's going to pop to a lot of, um, optimizers and in projections. Right. So not only is this this primary stack kind of a solid value grab, it's also some expected leverage here. Absolutely. And I mean, this is one of my biggest regrets of last week was that I did not look at Justin Fields, a player who I had actually been on in weeks one and two, but, you know, just kind of convinced myself that he has no ceiling, um, you know, with Arthur Smith as the uh, offensive coordinator. And so I just kind of forgot about him with, with uh, Najee Harris getting that ownership this week. He was a great leverage play and ended up working out perfectly. And so this is kind of that same situation. People started for value. They go to Sermon and Flacco. And this stack is definitely that perfect leverage. Yeah, 100%. All right. So where do you want to go next here with this lineup? Uh, I've got five slots to go. Tight end defense still. Yeah, so I want to go... I want to attack this Baltimore and Cincinnati game environment, but I want to do it in a way that I think the field is not going to get to. Um, We'll start with an area that the field probably is going to get to, but his price is going to subdue his expected ownership because value is tight. So we'll put in Derek Henry. Um, Again, this is a guy 26 and 27 running back opportunities in the last two weeks after kind of starting the season off. Um, not with training wheels, but they were kind of um, not feeding him workhorse type usage. And then we see two game environments where um, the Ravens were able to control the, the the tempo and the pace of the game on the ground. And we saw Derrick Henry see 26 opportunities against the Cowboys and then 27 against the Bills. So this is another spot against the Bengals where they, they're – their defense is able to overcome a lot of, um, I mean, they had a lot of departing defensive players this off season, but they, they do it through Lou and Rumo's defense. Um, that said this bully style 
offense that the Ravens run um, shouldn't be really hindered too much in this spot. So penciling Derrick Henry in with the expectation of 22 running back opportunities with clear upside for more, as we've seen, um, is a nice way to attack this slate where, again, value is going to be hard to come by. So these higher priced players are probably going to see subdued ownership. Um, and then to get the value um, from this game environment and attacking this game environment then in a way that I think the field is probably not going to get to, let's put in Eric All Jr. at tight end. Um, week four was the first time that he out-snapped Mike Gesicki. Um, he has caught four, he has been targeted four times and caught all four targets in each of the last three games. Um, and honestly, he's a he's a more well-rounded tight end as compared to Mike Gesicki. So he saw 40 offensive snaps in week four. That was at 60% um, rate. And Mike Gesicki was down at 22 snaps for 33%. So um, we could be seeing a flippening here um, at the tight end room in Cincinnati. And Eric All is, like I said, he's a rookie, but he's a, a more well-rounded tight end to have on the field. He's capable of blocking. Mike Gesicki is an absolute zero um, in anything <laughs> blocking. So um, they're playing him out of the slot. Eric All is a guy that can kind of do more at the position. So that should influence his snap rate as the season progresses. And if it's happening now through the first four weeks of the season, that's something I kind of want to be ahead on um, in, a, in a year where tight end is just so gross. So it, it accomplishes a lot for us. It, it gives us exposure to this game environment. We know the Bengals are in a pass funnel matchup. We know they're leading the league in pass rate over expectation. Excuse me. So it, there's a lot going for it um, for this pairing in Derrick Henry and Eric All this week. Love that. And yeah, that really opens up a ton of salary. Still have defense to get to. So um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited kind of what direction you're looking to go next here. Let's pencil in our defense and see what we're left with. Um, there's a, a lot on the surface here to like at defense this week. Um, typically, when I'm starting off my builds, I scroll down in defense and see like how low I can go and still be comfortable. Um, and here. I think, yeah, I think doing that this week will lead us to the Broncos at 2,900. The Same Broncos, thing I landed on yesterday. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, the Broncos are a team that is playing some solid defense right now. They held the Jets to nine points. They held the Buccaneers to seven points in the last two weeks. Um, they're generating pressure in the backfield, which is what we want. And this um, Las Vegas offense is incapable of running the football, so we expect them to be throwing, setting up situations for Broncos pass rush to get home. Um, and this is a team that has five turnovers generated through four games. So that's not a, I mean, that's not a negative, but the big thing is the 12 sacks over the last two weeks. So um, an opponent that can't run the ball, they should be dropping back. We want those sacks. Um, and this is a team that hasn't scored a defensive touchdown yet, but if they're putting themselves in position to generate those opportunities is kind of what we want to see here. Absolutely. Yeah, that game has a 37 point total uh, Denver at home. I, I think that's a smash play at defense. Yeah, so now we got some solid salary to work with. Um, and I think this is going to work out perfectly, actually, um, and attacking a game environment that probably won't see a ton of interest. And that's the Packers and the Rams um, with the Packers. We have Christian Watson expected to miss significant time with a high ankle sprain. And I think that's going to lead a lot of eyes to Dontavian Wicks. But if we look at historical trends, the primary piece against zone coverage from this Packers team over the last two years has been Jaden Reed. Um, so while it seems a little like it could be point chasey, um, Jaden Reed kind of pops against a, a, a defense that, let me pull the exact number, um, they are fifth in the league in zone coverage rate. The Rams are at 77.7%. So, um, everything kind of lines up for another, this could be another eight, nine, 10 target game for Jaden Reed. And we kind of, we know what he can do against zone and with volume. So Jaden Reed at 6,500. And I think that leaves us exactly the amount for Kyron Williams. And that's big. 
That's big. Now I got to ask you like, in terms of ownership, do you think people are just going to be looking elsewhere to those games at the top, like Arizona, San Francisco, just because people like to flock towards the, the game totals that are in the fifties as far, I mean, I don't think this game will go 100% overlooked, but a little bit more overlooked than maybe the highest total games. Yeah. Um, with that game. And again, I need to, I haven't done my breakdown of the, of the, the 49ers and, and uh, Cardinals, but on first look, that game is one where the 49ers should not have a problem kind of controlling the game environment because what the Cardinals want to do, how they structure their offense, they want to run the football, and then they're going to build around that. They're going to struggle to do that against a 49ers team that has one of the most athletic linebacker cores in the league. So yeah. um, in that situation, this is more Kyler Murray out of structure. Um, and he's going to be forced to kind of win despite his play caller um, in Drew Petzing. So um, there's a lot more paths for that game to fail than I think the field is going to give credit for. So I'm not overly concerned with, hey, this roster doesn't have a piece from that spot. Um, like with Jordan Mason is probably the best grab from that game, but he's priced 300 below Kyron Williams now. Um, so Kyron Williams leads the league in red zone opportunities this season. He's playing a Packers defense that continues to struggle on the ground. Um, you know, they've had some issues through the air over the last couple of weeks, but they've had two significant injuries in their secondary. Um, basically just Eric Stokes left back there. So, um, do we see Jair Alexander return this week? I think it's likely. Um, yeah, so they should be getting some bodies back in the secondary that kind of funnels things back towards the ground. Um, and then we've seen kind of how Sean McVay has handled um, his offense without Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. I'd expect them to just highly focus on Kyron. Um, and then, like, speaking of the the roster construction here, um, in today's age of the league, we're kind of conditioned to not pay up at running back. Um, and the field is not going to want to do it times two. Um, and I think there's just a massive, massive path to each of these backs seeing 22, 25 running back opportunities in this spot this week with, we know, massive, massive red zone and goal line usage as well. Yeah. No, man, I absolutely love this Green Bay and L.A. Rams game. And I figured that you would like like it as well just because of you've talked about already on this show this year how the rams the way they play defense they just are pretty stagnant and they kind of give you the same look over and over and i mean i think we've seen already that matt lafleur for green bay he's a pretty good offensive coordinator or he you know he's a good play caller and so i absolutely love this spot yeah so this kind of this roster kind of built itself after we really did. penciled in like our primary stack um which that's awesome, but like also it probably, oh no, I won't say probably, but it might need some tweaks um, as the week passes. But so, I mean, you look at the roster up to down, um, we're attacking a game environment we like in the Colts and the Jags. Um, we're attacking a game environment we like in the Ravens and the Bengals, and we're doing it in a way that the field probably isn't going to. Um, and then we get this tertiary game environment in the um, Packers and the Rams, and that's really it. We have three big bets we're making on this yep. roster instead of you know a nine-way parlay that we're trying to hit. Um, so, yeah, I think it came together pretty nice here. Absolutely. Uh, Hilo, great stuff, man. A anything else you want to add before uh, we ship this one out? Again, very early look, but I still think this is a, pr a pretty sharp way to look at things. Yeah, no, and that's kind of going to be the the theme moving forward is if scoring is down across the league, um, if teams are not passing for as many touchdowns, that makes the game environment bets that much more important because if one game environment pops off when all the others are falling short, you're going to need access to that game environment in order to win. Um, so that's why I like kind of how, how centrally focused this roster is um, where again, we're just making three game environment bets. We're not kind of smattering all, all over the place. Um, so correlation is going to be even more important, I think, moving forward than what we've seen over the past. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Awesome, guys. Thanks for joining us here on the DFS Lab. Uh, make sure to join us tomorrow, Wednesday. That'll be Mike and Maximus. They'll be doing the FanDuel Focus Show. Hilo, as always, really appreciate it, man. And uh, we'll catch you next time. See you, dude.